All right. Good morning. Um, so I'm wearing something a little bit different today. Uh, just as as God has had us in our sermon series, we're now um, sitting in the marriage relationship that, that we'll turn to in a moment, and it just seemed appropriate um, of all the spaces that God has given that should be life giving and safe and secure. And intimate, uh, it's that marriage relationship. Um, but sometimes that's not the case, and there's a, a ton of brokenness around us. Uh, there's some brokenness within us, um, and there are loads of resources uh, for people who find themselves in domestic violence situations. Uh, it's been a pleasure of mine to begin that journey uh, with a group up in Rochester. Um, so you guys get a purple shirt as a reminder that October is Domestic Violence Awareness Day. Um, if you know folks that you just don't know where to go or who to call, uh, see me after. We've got some pretty solid resources that, that we can point you towards. So I want to, with that, invite you to Colossians chapter 3. Our series is the Lordship of Jesus, and that topic itself is its not really new, uh, it's not super creative. In fact, over a hundred times, the New Testament declares that Jesus is Lord. Um, and so we find ourselves asking, what difference does that make? The Lordship of Jesus is not new, but what if you and I, as his people, as his church, decided to live with the firm belief that Jesus is Lord? How would that affect us? What would change? What would become new? What would stop if we lived as if Jesus were Lord? Lord of your work life, Lord of the supper table, Lord of the Sabbath. Lord of your education, Lord of your sports ability, Lord of peace, Lord of all heaven and earth. What would that look like for you and for me if we chose to live under the banner that Jesus is Lord? The book of Colossians, uh, specifically chapter 3, is where we've been spending our time and where we are our time again. Um, This is written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, He wrote more than anyone else in the the New Testament. And he's writing to his friends in a city called Colossae. He spent some time there. He's now in prison. The only way he can communicate with his friends about the Lordship of Jesus is is to sit and write. And we have it as the book of Colossians. And in the, the first part of the book, Paul has probably more than any other place done an amazing job bragging about who Jesus is. He has a really high view of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. He speaks about the Colossians, his friends, have been strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that they might have great endurance and patience and that they joyfully give thanks qualified them to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. Paul speaks about this Jesus rescuing them from the dominion of darkness and bringing them into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Paul speaks about in Jesus we have redemption for our sins and that the fullness of the deity rests purely and fully in the person of Jesus. And that all things in heaven and all things in earth are to the Father through Jesus. I say that all because Paul is not writing a book about marriage in Colossians. He's writing a book about the lordship and the supremacy of Jesus. But in chapter 3, he begins to ask the question that you and I naturally would ask. What difference does the fact that Jesus is amazing, that the fullness of the deity is in him, that I've been reconciled through this Jesus who's done something in the cosmic world to bring all of heaven and earth under his lordship. What difference 
do these grand themes mean to me? What difference does it make in my life? And so chapter 3, we begin to hear some of the application of it. We're going to be in verse 19, uh, but we'll start reading in verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And he kind of paints this this big picture for us. In a general sense, here's some clothing you've got to get rid of. Here's some clothing you want to put on. Here's some ways you want to live because Jesus is Lord. And in verse 17, he begins to drive it right into our Mondays at noon and our Friday afternoons. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, whether you speak it, whether you do it, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And so over the, the past couple of weeks, we've kind of tried to use the mental picture that your week and my week is filled with hundreds, if not thousands, of whatever moments. They're just whatevers. And so this morning you got up, one of your whatevers was to shut your alarm clock off, Another whatever was to prepare. Maybe you stopped at a gas station tomorrow. One of your whatevers might be going to work. It'll be time with your kids. It'll be time uh, with a clerk at a store. It'll be time on a phone call. It is filled, life is, with all of these whatevers. But there are no more whatevers that have a greater impact on you and I than the whatevers in our marriage. And so Paul is going to focus right in on the most significant area for those of us who are married right into the marriage relationship. And I love the fact that the approach to last week and this week is not, hey, have a good marriage. That's not where Paul has been coming from, but rather in the heavens and in God's divine plan. These amazing things have taken place. And it's all under the banner of Jesus. Therefore, because Jesus is now Lord of the universe through His resurrection, it matters in your marriage. It matters in your marriage. So last week, uh, some of you commented that I seemed a little bit nervous preaching verse 8. You are accurate in that description. Um, see, we hold to 
uh, the inspired Word of God, and so I just preach God's Word um, as I can. And I, so therefore, I'm fully committed that whatever Paul means, whatever God means, that wives should submit to their husbands, I'm fully on board. But it doesn't mean I don't get nervous preaching about it. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord in verse 18. Meaning, Jesus is Lord of the wife. So this week, the lens turns towards husbands. Uh, This will be a topic that's a little more comfortable for me. Uh, Maybe I'll I'll be a little bit looser. We can laugh together a little bit because I'm not quite as rigid in verse 19 as 18. In verse 19, it says, Husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. I don't know if there's anything um, that brings more laughter than uh, speaking about marriage relationships, right? Some of the best stories that I've heard over the years, whether it's coming out of my marriage or someone else or someone's kind of written something about it. Um, one of them, if I remember it accurately, was a woman that, that writes in her diary, a wife. Uh, she writes something to the effect of, you know, it's been raining for days now, and my husband seems to be getting really depressed by it. Uh, he keeps standing by the window, staring. And if it continues, I'm just going to have to let him in. And <laughs> or, or the young husband who, who learned a lesson early on. Um, he learned that arguing with his wife is very, very similar to the uh, terms of agreement on the internet that you scroll through. Uh, eventually, you just give up and accept it. <laughs> um, most of the humor within marriage, um, most of the humor within marriage has something about the marriage going south, and that's kind of how we get the, the laugh out of it. But here's what I think. I think marriage is one of the greatest gifts from the greatest giver of gifts. I think marriage in God's heart from the beginning with Adam and Eve was one of his best designs ever. That a man and a woman would come together and be one flesh. And it's not that it's not hard. Marriage can be hard. But somehow it's also integral to God's design for kids and family, societies. And ultimately, this amazing thing, for better or for worse, uh, your marriage and my marriage, ultimately is this picture of Christ and His church. That God would give us a, a tangible place to work it out what God thinks of us and how He loves us, we can see it, even though it's marred, even though it's not perfect. It's an image in marriage as a husband loves a wife, so it is Christ loves the church. That's amazing to me that God would give us that. Husbands, love your wives. this, uh, I was talking with Rick this week. This is a, an interesting part of the series for me. Because each week we're just taking one verse. And it can be challenging, exciting, developing a sermon series. But when it's just one verse, it's like, all right, how do you develop that? Um, we're taking one verse a week. And this verse just has a couple of words in it. The first part is, Literally, the word for husbands. And so, wives, um, I want you to hear this like I encouraged the men last week to hear. Paul is speaking in the, we call it the vocative sense, meaning he's calling them like I would call you to get your attention. Hey, Jen, uh, that's a that's a vocative sense. And Paul is using that to be, hey, husbands, husbands. And so, ladies, this sermon... Although you can eavesdrop and listen in, 
the sermon is directed for the husbands because that's to whom God is speaking. Meaning, it is not your responsibility, wives, to manipulate things in such a way to get the result you want from your husband. Hear this because it's God's word for all of us, but it's directed to the husbands. Um, in fact, wives, it's not your job to act a certain way. You have the same job as the husbands last week. Our job is not to get you to obey God's command. Our job is to make it easy for you that you would like to fulfill Jesus' command. In the same way, wives, you can make it very easy or very difficult for your husband to live with the Lordship of Jesus in his marriage. You can make it easy or you can make it hard for your husband to love you, to agape you. And as far as I can tell, that's about the extent of the wife's job for this verse. You can either make this easy or you can make it hard, but your husband's call to live under the Lordship of Jesus in your marriage does not change whether you make it easy or you make it hard. And as Paul calls out to the husbands, he literally can be saying, Scott, Mark, Brian, husbands, pay attention to this. Husbands is the first word. We're going to look at love in a minute. The third word is simply your wives. Husbands, love your wives. Not the antique 1964 Corvette in your garage that you've spent 11 years restoring. Husbands, love your wives. Not your job. Husband, love your wives, not the computer or the woman offering pleasure there. Not your kids or your high school Friday night buddies. Husband, love your wives. Not your co-worker that has been encouraging you and validating you at a time that you've needed it. Picture this for a minute. Guys, if we uh, create in our imagination an alien from planet X, which is not really a thing. And this alien comes down to Earth and he has no idea about human culture. So he doesn't know me, he doesn't know what a husband is. And all we do is share our uh, calendar, our schedule, and we share our checkbook, our bank account, to this creature so that he can see where are we spending our time, where are we spending our money, and give him some sort of like word cloud for our conversation. Here's the things we talk about. Our time, our money, and what we talk about. What would be the conclusion of that alien from Planet X? What would he say is Scott's primary uh, objective? What would he say, based on your time, your money, your speak speech, what would be your that he would discern? I mean, we'd have to get through the layers, right, of explaining to this alien that, yes, I spend a load of time and a load of money towards taxes, but I do not love taxes. And once we get that to the side, maybe he'd have a pure view of some things that I do love. Here's, I think, what Paul is ultimately getting to for husbands. I speak this as a husband who's learning and doesn't always get it right, too. That your life is to be your number one priority. So I borrowed a little visual here to help you remember this. So this is coming from the, the Libby family. I verified that the right finger was going up before I borrowed this. So So otherwise, I would change the marriage series right there, right? (laughs) That, That Paul is calling husbands men. There's one person 
in the world that needs to know that you are their number one encourager. You are their number one fan. And she's called your wife. She's been given to you expressly so that you can love her. Not because you need to do it, but because she needs it. So, we are in a church. Um, can we put our next slide up, Ken or Madeline? Um, we are in a church that we don't value political correctness because otherwise we'd have to edit the Bible. Um, and I'm not a fan of that. And so I just want you to to read out of First Peter. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir to the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. I don't know what a weak woman is. I'm still waiting to meet one uh, around this church. I certainly do not have one in my marriage. (laughs) And yet somehow, I think in God's view of this whole thing, that He's placed a husband to care and nurture and protect and love a wife because she is a weaker vessel. And it's the strength of the men that God says, offer it to her. Give it to her because she needs it. And God doesn't shy away from why the wife needs the strength and the love of the husband. Because she's a weaker partner. And uh, we could spend some time unpacking that and maybe contextualize it. But at the end of the day, I think we can also sit back and say, okay, God. You've given me the strength of manhood, whatever that means, and I want to use it to love and to serve and to give for my wife. And in the middle between these two of husband, wife, is the word love. Husband, love your wives. There's a few different words that that are used for love in the New Testament. One of them is uh, philos, philos, which uh, we all know, like Philadelphia, the city. How ironic is that, right? <laughs> the city of brotherly love in Philadelphia. Um, but that's one of the New Testament words. That's like the Thanksgiving uh, get-together that you and your aunt and your uncle and your relatives have. Uh, maybe you invite some neighbors in. That's a good moment for philos. For that brotherly kindness, that family kind of uh, friendship and love. That's one. It's not what Paul uses here. The second one is eros. And you can just hear it in that word, right? That's that sexual, um, intimate, physical kind of fire love. But the word that Paul uses here, is this amazing word, agape. Agape. Husbands, agape your wife. This is the love word that consistently, every time I could find, is used when it's speaking about God loving. Whenever you see God loves or Jesus loves, the word that's sitting in there is agape. And it's this powerful word that always, every time, has the object of the love in view. Where some love can be self-satisfying and we get feedback or we get something from it. Agape love never has that in sight. God loves because he has you and I in mind. Period. God does not benefit from loving us. Right? In fact, God paid a high price to agape us. 
Because agape is always sacrificial too. That kind of love that a husband is to have for a wife always involves action. Agape is more an act of the will than a feeling. Although feelings absolutely can be a part. But the good news in it, men, you are free to do agape even when you don't feel like it. You are freed up to love your wives, to agape your wives, even when your emotions don't tell you that that's the appropriate thing to do. Because agape is not rooted in emotions. It's rooted deep inside of you, an act of the will. That you would delight in the object of love. I think that's why... Paul in Ephesians can liken the agape from a husband to a wife to that of the relationship of Christ in the church. We have this beautiful description. I want to invite you to turn there in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And before you groan and moan like, oh, I know that chapter. I just want to do one thing. All the love words in here are agape. It's the same love that that we're talking about. And I want to read this just a little bit different. The first three verses, I'll just read out and then we'll make our shift. Now, I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Alright, here we go, men, husbands. My love for my wife is patient. My love for my wife is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. My love for my wife is not rude. My love for my wife is not self-seeking. And it is not easily angered. My love for my wife keeps no record of wrongs. My love for my wife does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. My love for my wife always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. My love for my wife Never fails. That kind of love, I don't think is to be in theory where it's a great wedding chapter. But I think it's supposed to be really close to home for us guys. That Paul is describing the kind of love that comes from God Himself and that we are to offer our wives. In fact, 1 John 4 says God is agape. That everything God does flows from His love for you. That God doesn't love because we're amazing. God loves because He is agape. And out of that deep place of God's heart, He shares that love out for you and I. So He's able to love the unlovable and the unlovely. Not because we deserve to be loved or because of any excellence we possess, but because it's His nature to love. And God is always true to His nature. And so we're just going to be open and honest here for a minute. Guys, sometimes it is hard to agape our wives. Sometimes it's real easy. Other times it can be hard to love our wives. Your example, the place that you turn to, is not necessarily another guy learning from him, although we can learn from one another. 
Our place is not necessarily a book on how to improve your marriage and improve your relationship with your wife, although those can be helpful. You have an amazing place that you can turn. And I have an amazing example of what it means to love in the person of Jesus, who loved us while we were enemies and gave Himself to us in that sacrificial step to die on a cross to reconcile us to Himself. And I think in the same way, when I can begin to understand that kind of agape, that kind of giving, that kind of love, that's sacrificial and delights in the object of agape, I begin to have a sense that even if this is a hard time in my marriage, even if this is a rough patch in your marriage, men, you have the ability to choose agape when our eyes are set on Jesus who agape you even when you were unlovable and unlovely. We agape because we have an example who has loved us. The verse ends in Colossians. Husbands, agape, love your wives. And then he has this little phrase. In the NIV it translates it, and do not be harsh with them. The word behind harsh is actually bitter. Be bitter uh, with them. And the the Greek here is is sitting in a, in a way that it's describing this ongoing activity. Like it's a present, active, imperfect verb saying, don't keep on being bitter. Like don't keep going that direction. Don't be embittered towards your wives. The verb has the idea of being sharp, of being harsh, of being bitter. And I think it speaks of the friction that's caused sometimes by our impatience and our thoughtless nagging. And the reason I think Paul brings it up, if you don't choose agape, If we don't love our wives, something will fill that vacuum. And I think nearly every time what fills it is bitterness, perpetual irritation and fault finding, looking for what's wrong with your wife rather than choosing to share agape with her. And here's where we can land together. Some of you this morning may be bitter. You can be bitter whether you're 25 and newly married, or you can be bitter if you're 65 and have been married for 40 years. And you know you're bitter. You know you're bitter when what you see in your wife is her faults. When we catch our major vision of our wife is what's wrong with her, bitterness has crept in. Harshness has crept in. And here's why I love the approach to this. This is not just marriage advice. I believe Jesus is Lord of the universe. I believe Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. And so I believe that Jesus can have an impact within my marriage. Therefore, even if I am bitter at 65 years old, and I don't think a pattern can change in my marriage... Yet, I believe this. Jesus is Lord. I can submit to His Lordship and I can take a step of agape because of what He's done for me. I want to encourage you. If you think your marriage is what it's going to be, take a step. Take a small, faithful step of agape. Practice the Lordship of Jesus by taking a step of love. Small steps of selfless finger-wagging. Sometimes the smallest steps can put you in a new place. And here's, here's the bottom line truth for this. A husband loving a wife and not being bitter with them, that is what the Lordship of Jesus looks like in a marriage. 
That's what the lordship of Jesus looks like for a husband. As we close up, let me invite our worship team up here. And I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you with these words. I have been um, a part of our church and a part of families and marriages for a long time now. And while some of us struggle and some of us need to be obedient to Jesus' Lordship, I also want to encourage you. Some of you have been amazing testimonies for the rest of us. To see you agapeing your wife through some really difficult things. To see you learn what it means to submit your own desires to the welfare of your wife. Some of you have been amazing examples to many of us, and you've done this well, and I'm thankful. You get to be Jesus, your wife. Yeah. Husbands, you get to be Jesus to your wife. And it looks like agape. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter or harsh towards them. Father, may you help us in our journey as we learn to submit to your lordship in the various areas of life. And in the one that impacts us the most, God, I pray that you would help our marriages and in specific that you would help our husbands. God, help me to be more agape, more loving, than selfish. God, when that road gets tough, when we want to cash it in, Lord, may you give us a picture of Jesus in His fullness, of the extent He went to love us. Lord, may you encourage us towards faithfulness and longevity before you. Lord, thank you that you are Lord of heaven and earth, and you are Lord of the husband as well. In Jesus' name, amen.